Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor Ross Binder. Before we get started, make sure that wherever you are listening, including on YouTube, you hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, you subscribe and leave that rate and review. It does help us out a lot and it makes us very happy. So first things first, Iowa gets the the 26 to 16 victory over Michigan State last night. Of course, a hell of a lot better than a week ago coming off that 31 to nothing loss to Penn State. But the headline is not the victory now. It is injury to Cade McNamara going down in the second quarter, first quarter, first quarter. First. Yeah, it was their second series. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Second Half, drive. Halfway through the first quarter. Yes. Second series goes down with that non-contact injury. Of course, we don't want to speculate, but I think we all have a solid idea of what that means um, with that left knee. And did you guys see the video from Owen Sebring of KGAN? Ross, mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, did you see it? I didn't see you shaking your head. I did. Yes. Yep. So by the sounds of it in that video, he said, I effed up my knee, bro. Um, so that's not good few media members when we were in the press box, Adam and I said, well, there goes the season. And um, obviously they did take the victory over a lowly Michigan State team. Adam, I'm going to go to you first because you and I both heard that, uh, not from just one person. Do you agree? Is that is that it? Obviously, no, I don't agree. And I don't think okay. that. I don't think a whole lot of people in that locker room or, or on that coaching staff agree with a sentiment like that. I mean, I get it. And as I wrote in my post game article, I think some goals, I, and I think the ceiling has sort of changed for this program or at the very least for this season, not for the program as a whole, but you know, we're, we're talking about a guy Deacon Hill who was, a distant second place in the QB race. And <clears throat> some of that was a little bit by default too, because Joe Labus was also hampered with injuries. So Hill spent a lot of time in the summer practicing with the ones, uh, not only before Cade McNamara was cleared to practice fully, but then when he was suffering that strained quad, Hill was once again practicing with the ones. So he has that little bit of, you know, edge and, and, and that bit of experience, but still, as soon as McNamara was healthy, he was right there back under center. So that does tell you something about where these guys sit in, in what they've shown in practice. So the season's not over by any stretch. Uh, I don't think that you could look at where I was standing right now. I, I, I still think there's eight, maybe even nine wins on the table for this team. And that is the sort of season that has really sustained and almost what, whatever the inanimate version of personified is uh, that, I mean, that's been a typical Iowa season. And, and I don't say that in a bad way, there are so many programs that would kill to be winning eight, nine games a year. So the season's not over, but when you lose a starting quarterback like this, it is going to have significant repercussions for the the last seven games of the regular season and whatever comes next. I, I think that's inescapable. Ross, do you agree? Yeah, I, I, yeah, you have to agree. I think with that because this is, you know, the devastating injury. Like you said, McNamara was the clear number one quarterback on the roster. He was the guy that you know they went out to the transfer portal to get him to try and, you know, raise the ceiling for this offense to, you know, improve it, uh, get better production, you know, put Iowa in a position to, you know, contend in the Big Ten, hopefully, with him. And, you know, now it looks like he's probably out for the duration of the season. So, you yeah. know, I think you do have to recalibrate. Um, you know, you've still got good defense, some great special teams, uh, but a whole lot of question marks on offense now. Um and not just 
not just Cade. He's he's the biggest question mark, but there are a lot of other question marks too, which we'll probably discuss later. Uh, I I also think this is an interesting situation for Iowa because uh, you know you and I have been writing about Iowa for quite a while, Adam, and I honestly don't recall a, a situation where the starting quarterback suffered a you know potentially season-ending injury like this you know, partway through the season. We've seen other Iowa quarterbacks under Ference, you know, deal with, um, you know, injuries and being hurt during the season, obviously. But, you know, they, they always returned. Um, this would be a, something different, which, you know, when Ference has been here, Kirk Ference has been here 25 years, there's not a whole lot of something difference you can, uh, you can find in a given season. Yeah, the really the only historical corollary that is going to come up is Ricky Stancy and that, and I I am compelled to point out that it was an illegal hit by Corey Wooten, it, <laughs> and uh, you know it was it was something that you need to get flagged, and instead Northwestern got a touchdown out of it because God isn't real. Um, setting aside my anti Northwestern uh, <laughs> biases for just a second here. No, they just don't belong in the Big Ten, I don't think. Anyway, <laughs> but that is, that's it. In a quarter century of Kirk Ferentz being in Iowa City, that's that's basically the only, you know, corollary you're going to find. And, and even then, Stanzi was back for the Orange Bowl. So yep. I am not optimistic that McNamara, you know, uh, we too are not going to speculate, but, you know, when he is on crutches after the game kirk won't even talk about how cade's doing you know how how he's handling the injury because i asked him post game and and he basically said you can figure that one out for yourself and and i i understand that i respect it but you know it's it's really not hard to put two and two together on this one so i i don't expect him back for the bowl game if i i will be as happy as anybody to be wrong on that one but Based on what we saw his knee do, based on what we've seen, you know, the problems that we've seen him uh, encounter in the months prior to this, and just all of the practice time that he's continuing to miss, when that has been something that Ference has mentioned quite a bit, especially as this offense has struggled, that, you know, he missed a whole lot of practice time with a bunch of guys that he's really never played with before outside of Eric All. And now he's going to be missing the last seven, I guess, seven and three quarters of the season with the knee injury and, and all of the continuing rapport that you build with your receiving core in that, you know, in that two months of practice time, the season's a wash regardless of what they find on the scans tomorrow. It's it, his season's a wash, and and that's really too bad because he's been through a lot, and it's it's just it's not what anybody has in mind, and and really what nobody deserves to have happen to them. So you feel bad for that, and we'll just see how Deacon Hill handles, you know, just having the reins full time and and not having to look back over his shoulder for any reason. Cause I, 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 I don't think that Labus, especially missing all the time that he did, I don't think he's going to be a serious contender unless something, you know, sort of awful happens to Hill too. And, and you really don't want to see that happen. Tommy Paholsky season. I'm calling it right now. Just kidding. Oh, boy. <laughs> Walk on freshman. No, 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 no. Um, but oh, that has happened though. Uh, you, you have to go back to, I, I want to say 1990 or 91. I was actually in Kinnick stadium for, it was the Illinois game and Iowa was already out at least one or two quarterbacks. And then more guys get hurt. I, I think Matt Ide, E-Y-D-E was one of them. And at that point they're dipping into the, you know, the freshmen and the walk-ons and all that. I think they're at their fifth string QB at, at one point. You'll be shocked to learn that Illinois just wiped the floor with Iowa that day. And, and that ended up being a little bit of a bust of a season. Shocking, I know. But that's how far back you have to go. Elliot, you weren't even born at that point. <laughs> I was not so, alive. So this was not is, not yeah. born for another six years, actually. So and, you know, you didn't have to you didn't have to go that far. You didn't <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry. All right. My bad. But but that is, I mean, that's that's sort of 
how close Iowa is to this precipice of a basically once in a generation QB crisis. If if Hill goes down, and then it's just Labus and then prayer behind him. You know, Mark Marco uh, Lainez. You know, he's he's a true freshman. He, under no circumstances would he be expected to play this year. And now no. <laughs> he's he's getting and closer and closer to the depth chart. And it's Cooper time. <laughs> I was just gonna say that. Dang it. There was actually, <laughs> so I, I think I may, I've probably said it like several times on the pod, being that Cooper and I went to the same high school, salt tiny area, Northwest Iowa. There was a sign that was going around. I, I think it was either an Old Bolt or an Ida Grove that said it was last year. It was 2022 when the offense was awful. It said, put Cooper at quarterback. So yeah. Hey man, we'll see. State anyway. Yes. Two time state title winner. I, I don't believe I don't quote me on this, but I don't believe my high school won a state playoff game, not like in the dome, but like just a playoff game in general prior to Cooper DeGene. So there you go. Anyway, now, hey, state high school champion playoff winner. He's taking them to the playoff now. I quarterback. I <laughs> calling it right now. Russ the there. Right. <laughs> One thing that Adam said is that he sees this team more as an eight and four, nine and three team rather than, you know, the potential of 11 and one or or 10 and two going forward. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's the ceiling now after the McNamara injury? Yeah. I mean, I think that feels more realistic after what we saw Um, just based on the way the offense looked last night. And honestly, the way the offense has looked all season. I mean, it's just, it's not, a lot of good things to take away from that side of the ball and you know you just look at the that ceiling looks you know shorter and or smaller whatever you, however you want to put it and you know this the way they managed to win that game you know just a lot of smoke and mirrors you know we get a, a part they get a power turn touchdown the defense forces multiple turnovers four field goals like that's a win i mean kirk ferentz has won a lot of football games that way no question like the a lot of football games but is that a sustainable formula over, you know, the next seven games? That's tough. Um, Iowa does have one offensive touchdown in two Big Ten games so far. Not great. So I think, you know, when you look at it that way, then you, you never know exactly what could happen. But eight and four or so does feel more realistic than, uh, you know, 10 or 11 wins right now. I was a little skeptical of that number, but then I pulled up the remainder of Iowa's schedule and it's still, it's not, it's not great by any means to play at these. When I'm looking at it, obviously Purdue next week, homecoming for, for Iowa and then at Wisconsin. And then of course there's going to be a game in there where it's way too close uh, between probably Illinois, Minnesota, maybe even Nebraska and they drop it. and, And that's where they end up at that eight and four, nine and three spot. Um, I truthfully, I, I hesitate to say that their ceiling drops that much because it's not like the offense was good anyway. That's, yeah. that's the thing. And, and what I have here in, in my notes is that there's, there's a couple, couple positives when you look at Deacon Hill coming in and, and here's the thing is he's more last night. He looked significant. I maybe significantly is a strong word, but more mobile than Cade has to this point in the season with that injury. He stepped up in the pocket. I would almost say it's probably a combination of two things, pocket awareness and, and being a little bit more mobile because he doesn't have an injury. And I thought he showed great pocket awareness last night. Um, The QB sneak is back for sure with him under center. He's got a cannon of an arm and he's durable because of that size. And so Yes, there are going to be negatives to come with that. Cade, the experience. Cade having won a bunch of games in the Big Ten, gone to the Big Ten championship and won it, gone to the playoff. And then you look at Deacon Hill and before, well, here's the thing, is before he committed to Iowa out of the portal, he committed to Fordham. So that's of note. Fordham, FCS powerhouse, they air it out like hell. That probably was 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 fun for for uh or would have been fun for, for deacon and i'm looking at his profile out of high school he was a 5.73 star for uh on rivals and had offers not only from wisconsin but kansas state nevada and ucla 
also had interest from BYU, Fresno State, San Diego State, UNLV, and Washington State. So so a lot of Pac-12 country um, or the area formerly known as the Pac-12 soon to be. And then, of course, Wisconsin ends up at Iowa. And there are things to be encouraged by with Deacon. The decision making is going to be the big issue and receivers getting used to how freaking hard he throws the football. Obviously, we saw that last night with six drops. Yeah, in a way, he is more of a Kirk Ferentz quarterback than Caden McNamara is. And that's for, for better or worse, right? Because McNamara sort of fits more of a C.J. Beathard mold, and Beathard went on to an NFL career. And I was big, you know, statuesque guys who can throw it 80 yards downfield or, you know, at 100 miles an hour typically don't have that path to the next level but we do know that Ferentz likes to have those guys who are maybe not threats to run the ball although I will say I was pleasantly surprised by Hill's mobility when he was on rollout passes or otherwise like moving the pocket finding different passing lanes I thought he did a pretty good job of that uh better a better job than I was expecting candidly for a a guy who and I I'm a little upset that Iowa only ran one QB sneak and it ended in a uh, lineman getting injured because I've been sitting on a Deacon bruise pun for now 70 or for now, like 24 hours. And I'm not, I'm not sitting on it for another week, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm using it right now. Deacon bruise Uh, shout out to all the steely Dan fans out there. Really topical reference, Adam, but. (laughs) And all our colleagues, all our colleagues were going with sneak and Deacon. So yeah. Uh, well, that's oh, and some other ones that we can't really say on air uh, <laughs> not while the sun's up. Uh, but but maybe go Iowa awesome after dark. We'll 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 get into some of that. But but the point is, this is a skill set that Kirk Ferentz is at the very least familiar with coaching, and so that is you know whether this that means that this offense is going to look more like the Nate Stanley era or you know the Spencer Petrus era. Uh, if you want to take it back to the Nathan Chandler era uh, and, and really even it's not too far off from what Ricky Stanzi's skill set was, even though he wasn't one of those like big 240, 250 pound guys, he was still a drop back look gun it. And if I make a mistake, so what? And, you know, and as long as his balance sheet was more positive than negative, Kirk was fine with it. And I think the same thing is going to be the uh, the case here. As long as Hill is making more good decisions than bad decisions, I don't think he's ever going to have a perfect game decision-wise because there's just some risk in quarterbacking and that guy just loves to throw the ball. That, at the very least, I think Kirk Ferentz and Brian Ferentz and everybody on that staff know he is for somebody who's a first year QB, he's more of a known quantity than would usually be the case. So it doesn't seem like square one doesn't seem like a situation where they don't know how they're going to use him. It's just a matter of how well he puts it together while being thrown into the situation that he really wasn't, you know, planning on and preparing for necessarily. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, You know, you mentioned that, you know, McNamara was more in the C.J. Beathard mold. And I think that was, you know, that was the Cade we were hoping to get. It wasn't the Cade we actually got because of that, you know, quad injury in training camp. You know, that was, you know, that limited Cade to his mobility was, you know, severely compromised in all the games that we saw him play this season. Um, So, you know, the Cade that, Iowa thought they were getting was not quite the cave they ended up playing. Uh, I do think Hill, like you meant, you know, I think that Nate Stanley, Ricky Stanzi um, comparison is a very apt one for Deacon Hill. Like that, that definitely matches his skill set. Um, you know, he is that classic drop back passer. Um, the rollouts was one thing I noticed too. Iowa did not roll out McNamara hardly at all at, in the first uh, four games of the season that was back on the table with, with Hill. That's been a staple of the Iowa playbook for 20 plus years. So getting that back, I think would be helpful. The QB sneak is helpful. You know, there are, 
there are things he can do that McNamara couldn't do that can help this offense. Now, you know, again, the decision making, uh, throwing passes that don't, you know, threaten to break his receiver's hands. Those those are things to work on for the next few weeks for sure. But yeah, they the the one thing that I'll add uh, one that rollout being the staple of the Iowa offense, you're, you're correct. And and there are some people on social media. I, I haven't looked to double check having been on the press box, but some of them were saying that's the same, you know, route combo that they've been running on rollout since 1999. And, you know, I, I can't verify that, but it feels right. Uh, but, you know, as long as it's effective, fine, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how effective effective is here in the year of our lord 2023 as god's not real and then uh the year of our lord 2023 in the same podcast i'm sorry that was just funny um anyway for in regards to that rollout especially for an offensive line that has continued to struggle i think that's additionally productive um and and just in general of 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 Deacon being a little bit more mobile, that's going to help that offensive line out a lot, just in terms of numbers in general going forward for for uh, you know QB pressures and QB hits and and what have you. But when we look at the offense as a whole, there's the six drops. There's let me look at the stats from last night regarding the running game because it was awful. Twenty seven rushes for sixty one yards, long of nine yards. That includes three rushes by Deacon Hill for negative three yards and one rush of zero yard, zero yards for Cade. That was the one where he got hurt. So in total between the running backs, Terrell Washington Jr. had one rush. Uh, Kamari Moulton had nine for 25 and LaShawn Williams had 12 for 38. Running game was atrocious. Six drops by the wide receivers. Uh, Brian clearly heard all the outside noise about targeting wide receivers on that first drive because that's what they did. They tried to set up a few wide receiver screens, which I think that was the first time I saw all season. I said something about it on Twitter and a back and forth with Blake Hornstein and Deacon threw one right into the dirt on on well, one of those receiver screens to Deontay Vines. We heard the chance of fire, Brian, not only from the student section this time. We could hear it in the press box. It was it was everybody. You could hear it on the TV broadcast. So offense, though the ceiling doesn't exactly change with Deacon because of how bad it's been, it was still awful. <laughs> it was still bad. It's still probably right, right around 131st in the country. Yeah, that, I mean... <laughs> You hate to see a crowd sort of turn on a, a, a staff member mid game, but it's also, you know, no one can claim that they didn't see something like this coming at this point. And it was, you know, it was, it was also mid game too, right? It's not like opening kick, you know, Iowa gets the ball to 25 and in the jeering, it had already started, you know, there was an opportunity for the offense to sort of, Get productive, especially against the Michigan State defense that is yeah, all year. I mean, Washington ate him up. And and I, I understand Iowa doesn't have Michael Penix or any of the receivers that he was throwing to. But, boy, Iowa made that Sparty defense look a lot better than it has all year. And there were some really uninspired, at best, play calls, especially in a situation where Iowa was – I think the first time that they were up by double digits was about four minutes to go in the game. Uh, maybe, maybe even less than that. It's like two minutes. Cause Cooper returned the punt with about four minutes. That's right. Yep. And the only and that, was, that was, yeah, how the they took double... the <laughs> it was four minutes left. So it wasn't a situation where you just try to sit on a lead, bleed the clock out and be like, all right, well, we got through that with the backup quarterback. They still had to go and try and win the game. And yes, you can look at the fact that Iowa scored the last 16 points of the game. Or you can look at the fact that between the three field goal drives and the touchdown, well, Four the field goals uh, of the last 16 points that Iowa scored. Sorry. Oh, 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 oh. After, okay. after Iowa was down 16 to 10. So they had three field goal drives and that touchdown. Touchdown came on special teams. 
but three field goal drives combined for 29 yards of offense. And they were, I mean, some of that was the result of some really nice field position because they started to force those turnovers. But these are also field goal drives, right? It's it's not as if they just ran out of space because the, you know, the end zone's right there. They were still stopped on third down on all of those after a combined 29 yards of offense. So, you know, yeah, they put up enough points to win, but that was very complimentary football. We'll have to put it that way because it, it wasn't the offense taking the game over by any stretch. It was them taking advantage of some really, really great game changing plays by defense and special teams. And a win is still a win, but when you look at, you know, where that productivity is and, and whether that's up to standards for anybody, regardless of how good the defense or special teams is, yeah, a lot of reason to still be critical. And, you know, it's obviously it's going to be tough for everybody on that sideline because well, I'll say this, you know, there aren't a whole lot of fans in Brian Ferentz's corner, but a lot of the guys on that team are. And it stinks for them. And I'm sure it stinks for Brian, too. They And that's what the money's for, for coaches, right? Yes. <laughs> You, you, you do have to have a thicker skin as a coach, as a paid coach, especially somebody with that familial connection to the program. But, you know, it, it stinks for the players to to hear that and to still have to, you know, try to go out and perform and execute. And so that is, it, it's unfortunate. But when the production is where it is, it's also inevitable. Yeah, I mean, just about the offense. Um two stats that come to mind for me. I think I ran 14 like real drives. I think it was a total of 15, but the last drive was just taking a knee to get the victory. 14 yep. real drives and one touchdown on those 14 drives. Not good. And then they believe they finished with 222 yards, uh, which is below their season average, which I think is around 240. So, I mean, that's itself an extremely low ceiling to hit on offense and they did not hit that ceiling last night so you know just lots of really terrible offensive stats to look at lots of question marks on offense uh no good answers unfortunately i'm gonna add to those stats i'm gonna go through each drive um well (laughs) there were you said 14 real drives one two three four five six Half of them were either three and out or a turnover. Actually, add uh, another turnover in there. So eight of them were three and out or a turnover. Yeah. Um, field goal, punt, 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 touchdown, punt, fumble, interception, field goal, punt, 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 field goal, field goal. That's it. Yeah. Pretty bad. And and like Kirk said post game, he said something to the effect of, "Oh, I don't like third and outs either." So. And that's all he had to say about the fire Brian chant coming. I I don't know that there's anybody, any stat statistical database that tracks three and outs, but I have to think Iowa is very close to the top of leading the country in most three and outs this season. Like there are so many, and it's an every game problem. Like every game there's a stretch where Iowa has like three or four three and outs, like back to back to back or three out of four drives or something like it is it is continual. So one thing I'll, I'll hit on before we, before we move on from this topic, Adam, one thing you mentioned is that there are not a whole lot of fans in Brian's corner, but there are a lot of, or some players in Brian's corner. Are are we positive? Are we positive about that, that there are players in Brian's corner after the lack of production and just how much crap they get every day on social media and in public and and whatsoever. Are there players in Brian's corner right now? Because I would really understand some resentment going on internally. I'm not saying that I know that there is, but just just putting that out there. I when you started this, I I really really thought I knew exactly where you were going, and that was Cade's quote from after the Penn State oh. game, which was basically. 
hey man, I'm just the quarterback and you know, I'm not going <laughs> plays. And and that, you know, some of that was also the frustration of getting skunked uh on the road and 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 not only skunked on the road, but also your socks are wet and everybody's got a bad mood at that point. So, you know, I there there's only so much I was going to read into something like that, but it was also significant because he was based a lot of times we hear you know, something to the effect of we got to go out there and trust the play call and execute, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or when I was on the, in the increasingly rare instances where we're asking them about positive productive plays, usually that comes along with a, you know, it was a great play call at the time, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's, there's always a few positive things that get snuck in about how good the play calling was uh, in certain instances. And that feels like them, you know, making sure that they're in their coach's corner and also, you know, on a team like that, there's only so much energy and time that you can expend on deciding that you know some members of the team or some members of the coaching staff aren't good enough et cetera et cetera and and that is it's it, once he starts to go down that road um there's and once you start to have that locker room fracture that's when seasons really start to go downhill so you know once we start to hear things of that nature be worried but until then and and again, I'm only going to read so much in the Cade's quote after Penn State because everyone was in a sour mood. Uh, like everybody in that room was in a sour mood. Uh, unless we start to hear more and more of that, and there's a non-zero chance that we do, but unless it unless and until that happens, you know, I I just sort of need the evidence that there's that resentment building toward the offensive coordinator. And it's also a situation that's going to resolve itself one way or the other by the end of the year. Right. So these guys, once you're in that season as a football player, you're just going week to week, put your head down, focus on the things you can control. And after the season is when they start to, you know, sort of take that sort of personal stock in everything and how it went down and what they could have changed or, you know, what they didn't have control over. And again, like Brian's either still going to be there or not going to be there at that point. Right. He, he's that will be the completion of his opportunity to re-earn his job. So, yeah, I, I don't think you're going to get too much in the way of I'm trying my best, but the coaches are messing it up for me, et cetera, et cetera from these players at the very least not until 2024 <laughs> when we might start to get some candor out of them but uh yeah i anytime anybody asks even in a roundabout way after wins after losses after everything you know whether or not there's any like seeds of division etc these players are shutting it down like from the get-go unequivocally and I have to be able to take them at their word on that one until I've got reason not to. I guess I, um, the I, they've been very well trained in the Kirk Varent school of handling the, the media. And I can't help but think that they're always going to do that publicly. I'm thinking publicly, like, are we really taking them for their word full bore publicly in these media availabilities? Because they're not going to go out and say, yeah, Brian sucks, you know, like. No, but at, at, at the same time, it's really not fun to go out there and lie to people, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're talking about 18, 19, 20 year old kids. If they if they didn't mean the things that they were saying. I think it would be evident in their body language in you know, how thoughtful their answers are or aren't. Um, and I don't get that sense that they're being forced to say things that they don't really mean again, as yet. And it is a long season <laughs> and sometimes long seasons get really long uh, in, in the worst way possible. So if, if that starts to happen, I, I I think we can start to look for something like that again. But until then, 
you know, these guys seem sincere and, and I, there's only so much training you can do with 20 year olds, man. You know, at, at some point they, they like to say what's on their mind. And, um, you know, Nico Regani sort of the prime example of that. He, it, he, him being in his sixth year NF given season, that is, he's, he's definitely not going to start throwing out platitudes just because media told him to clearly and uh and and he is sort of at the front of the line of the like no we're not turning on each other that's not the point of anything we're doing so yeah i i just sort of have to take that at its word until we have a reason not to and uh, like like stuff in front of us as opposed to well that's not the way i would think even if it's not the way that i would think touche I, and on to a positive note, and to end on a positive note, football wise, here uh, on this episode of Hotcast, Cooper DeGene, Super Cooper, man. Uh, we we hit it at the beginning of the pod talking about him. He well, first of all, guys, he's not going to play offense. He's just not. That is, I'm just the conjecture has started. It has been on the board. It's been on Twitter. It's not happening. He's not going to play offense. He's going to return punts. And he's going to play damn good defense. And that's what he did last night, uh, effectively winning the game for Iowa with that punt return. And then, of course, having that uh, interception at the back of the end zone. Far and away, Iowa's best player. And I don't um, I wouldn't say that I I wouldn't say it's not close, but he's pretty damn good. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Uh, Cooper, you know, came through in a big way in that game last night. He, um, you know, he only returned one punt, but he picked a great one to return. Uh, obviously, there were issues with the other punts. They weren't as returnable. He finally got an extremely returnable punt. And, uh, you know, he he did exactly what you want him to do with that situation and what he's obviously been trying to do all season. And, uh, you know, the blocking lined up and he was able to, hit the holes and, you know, hit, get to the sideline. And once he got to the sideline, that, that play was over. Like no one was catching him at that point. It was uh, something to behold for sure. It's, you know, impressive to see what he's able to do. And, you know, that overshadowed like his interception too was fantastic. I mean, just some great toe tapping at the back of the end zone to, uh, you know, come down with that ball and get that interception. And that was a big play because they, the defense was, doing a fair amount of bending on that drive and they needed, needed to stop uh, and to not give up points too. And he made sure to do that. So, you know, just a couple of really exceptional plays by Dejean uh, last night. Yeah. I, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, all three of us witnessed that or experienced that play in different ways. Ross, you saw it on TV. I saw it from the press box and uh, Elliot, as I understand it, was a strictly audio only uh, experience. We're bringing that. it back up once again, Adam. Yes, <laughs> I went down the elevator because we can be on the field for the final five minutes of the game and uh, was in the tunnel on the way down. And I'm on the way down with Dallas Jones. And he says, like, well, we know it's going to be a punt. He goes, I bet uh, Cooper returns this back. And so I start running because the crowd starts to get progressively louder and louder. There's a initial yeah from the crowd and then he breaks open and then it's just a whole nother level and you hear fireworks and I run on down under the field and everybody's freaking out and I completely missed it. <laughs> so I got to tell you, um, even taking the situational aspect of it out, like just as a play on its own in a vacuum, it is that was a Tim Dwight level return. And, you know, say what you will about guys like Micah Hyde or even, you know, I guess sort of Tyler Sash, anybody else who's sort of been a return specialist in the Ferentz era, DeGene's the only one who turns that into a score. And you could, it would not be difficult to convince me that Dwight would not have scored on that play too. I mean, that was a one of one play. And to do that, in a game where Iowa is experiencing this much adversity, it, it has this much trouble with the offense and in missing all of these players. I mean, my goodness, if you just take an accounting of all the guys that were missing at that point in the game, 
And, you know, tie game late in the fourth quarter, Big Ten opponent under the lights. And he basically had to put the team on his back, and that's exactly what he did. And in the most spectacular way possible. I mean, I'm I'm telling you guys that if if that's not the play of the year for the Hawkeyes this season, it's it's going to take something absolutely monumental to top it. And one, I would like to see it. Because <laughs> that that would be fun to see too. But you know, it sort of under, underscores the fact that Iowa needed a gigantic play out of DeGene in that moment. And as soon as the punter line drove one straight to him for once instead of kicking it over his head. And, uh, oh, by the way, DeGene was lined up about 55 yards deep on that punt because of how often that guy was sailing him over his head and basically making a return impossible. Uh, That guy had basically the punting day of his life until the last two. One was the shank and then the other one was you know, booming it straight to DeGene in the middle of the field, too. So there there was no funneling that they could do. And scheme-wise, it was just go to the left as hard as possible, we, we learned afterwards. But his ability to make those four guys miss and then outrun everybody else to the corner, I mean, that is, that's one-on-one stuff. And underscores what a game-breaking talent he is. And I'll also point this out, Elliot, to go back to the start of your point. Iowa takes care of DeGene's energy level over the course of the game for reasons exactly like this. If he's out there for 10 or 15 offensive snaps, maybe Iowa gets some extra yards that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. But does he still have enough in the tank to make a game-breaking play like that in the last four minutes of the game? That is debatable. And I, I'm sure he would love the challenge, but you know, this isn't the first time that people have gotten the idea that maybe DeGene can play both ways. And and Ference has even said that he's talented enough to do it. It's just a matter of managing his workload, not only over the course of the game, but over the course of the season. And when you've got a guy who is that good as a cornerback, that good as a returner, and who's whose future is most certainly on Sundays and as a first round pick and and probably a high first round pick. You don't want to run him into the ground halfway through the season because you're trying to, you know, pick up some extra yards on the margin or you're you're trying to, you know, do something completely out of the ordinary, um, you know, just to give your your offense a a boost or a spark or, or what have you, you know, that's sort of, penny wise and pound foolish so yeah i for that reason we're just not going to see DeGene on offense he hasn't been practicing with the offense there's no and and you know fair and stuff doesn't really just toss guys in there just to see what happens and, and most coaches don't do that as well so that that's not a ference thing that's just a power five a d1 coach thing it's not going to happen and if ference had two guys like that maybe it would and uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe Brevin Dahl is that guy for Iowa's offense when you know he he makes it to Iowa City, right? There's there's going to be other guys who have an opportunity to be that sort of game breaking presence on offense. But as long as DeGene's future in the NFL is, is in the NFL is as a cornerback first, as a returner second, you're just not going to see him on offense, and that's that's not a failure on Kirk Ferentz's part. It's a, you know, it's just basic player protection. And so there's, it stinks, but just get to work on cloning the gene and uh, maybe you'll get somewhere. You have two of them. Great. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure Kirk could use about eight of them. Like seriously, they, you could, you could put, if you had eight Coopers to gene, you could probably put them in the two deep and still want more. That's how good he is. I will say after what happened to Travis Hunter two weeks ago, it's all the more reason to not put him on offense all the more after everything that Adam just laid out after everything we've heard from the staff, a lacerated liver 
will probably keep Cooper off the offensive side of the ball um, after seeing what happened to Travis Hunter. And lastly, on that Cooper uh, point of what he's been able to do so far this season, what he did last night, as the recruiting analyst, I'm obligated to remind you that he had zero other Power 5 offers, no group of five offers, four offers from schools in the Missouri Valley Football Conference, the FCS level. And then Iowa came in and swooped him up. So, so props to them. We'll, we'll say that they saw something that apparently other schools did not see two a doesn't have the talent that we need. Well, guess what? It does. So yeah, it's not the 1990s anymore. These, these it is guys not. can learn how to play high level ball at two a. So you also don't have to go to these suburban five, a schools to get in front of the right eyes either. So just a, just a little note for, for some unnamed high school talent in the state of Iowa. Just throwing that one out there. Anyway. Media days for women's and men's basketball coming up this week. Men today. It'll be, the podcast will be out here on Monday. Women on Wednesday. And, of course, we'll have football media availability on Tuesday. So a lot more to come on iowa.rivals.com from us, myself, recruiting analyst at Elliot Clough on Twitter, Elliot Clough, Adam Jacoby, our publisher and Ross Binder, our managing editor. Took me a while to think of that one. If you're not a premium subscriber yet, you can head over to iowadoutrivals.com backslash subscribe and get all that info from us. A couple of official visitors this weekend working on getting that intel and, of course, some other big time recruits in the 2025 class in both basketball and football there this weekend. So we'll be getting you all that info we possibly can. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Give us that thumbs up, leave that rate and review. It helps us out a lot here on Hotcast. So for now, we'll see you next time.